Well, good morning, everybody. So my name is Paul Imbrix. I think the, uh, the other um, colleagues, Rudiger, Marius, and Alexander have already been introduced by Francois. I mean, I, I, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to be back here in Lausanne. This is the fourth time uh, that I teach uh, uh, a um, uh, Swiss Society of Swiss Actuarial Association summer school. We did it twice on the book on extreme value theory, and this is the second time we do it on the quantitative risk management book. And every time I'm totally in awe with the quality and uh, the uh, charm with which Francois, Francois, don't leave, <laughs> which Francois wants to leave the room, no, no, in which uh, Francois organizes these weeks. So um, can you please already at the start of the conference and the summer school thank Francois and his colleagues for the amount of work they've done. <laughs> Thank you. Merci. Um, as you also see, there's a camera standing there, so they're filming the, um, the presentation for posterity, whoever posterity may be. Um, you will see during the week, it's a, uh, <clears throat> uh, the course we give is based on the book. You all have a copy of the book. Sorry for the weight of the book. It's like it is. Um, we will treat most of the material in the book in, of course, of a, a selected way. We cannot do the whole book. And each of us has taught courses of this type at various places we are. This time, special with the book will be also, we will use, well, they will use, um, our based presentations that you actually, actually see that the things we introduce you to have actually been probed and then can be worked out. And I'll come to that in a minute. So this is um, a very important website, is this top website. It's the QRM tutorial website, which is new since the, the first appearance of the book in 2015 and the last appearance of the book, um, uh, the second edition now, 2005-2015. Um, the website QRM tutorial, and I think most of you have already visited it. If not, do visit it. All the material is on there. The slides for this course are on there that you have. is about 400 slides, a bit over 400. The full material on QRM tutorial of, the, of all the slides, PDF format, are by now standing over 800 slides. Just shows you that we, don't, we cannot do the whole book uh, in one course. We take a, a carefully selected sample. Besides that, all the computer programs are programs in a dynamic way, because it's updated, you can all find them on the QRM tutorial. In the future, I think I can say that it will be exercise material on the course, et cetera, et cetera. So this is really the spine of the course, and I think the future versions of the book, Francois already said, well, we'll see you back at least in 2026, in 10 years' time. Um, it's, it's, uh, the QRM tutorial will be a very important aspect. So I just wanted to say that from the start. An overview of the course, there will be various topics we treat. It's an actuarial summer school. So and whereas the, most of the material we'll teach, you to, we'll teach to you is applicable way beyond actuarial science. The fact that it's an actuarial summer school, of course we'll do aspects and applications and examples coming mainly from the actuarial finance world. This will be particularly visible once we move later in the week into credit risk. So credit risk, of course, is one of the most important, if not the most important risk out there facing financial institutions. So that will be a very important part we will be discussing later in the week. Before that, all of the material <clears throat> I could basically, we could basically treat by switching from an application in engineering to an application in, in, in finance or insurance. But we stick to finance somehow to to keep a bit in the actuarial uh, realm. Okay, so that's just a, 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 a... And then you see the various aspects we will treat. Uh, I will not go into detail, but you see there are various aspects which are very much sort of statistical minded. So there are some aspects which are uh, uh, more time series financial minded. So we'll, we'll jump from here to there between the various application fields. But the, the, the basic idea will be to teach you quantitative risk management tools with a very strong actuarial statistical uh, background. 
OK. And then you'll see there's quite a lot of material there. I don't have to walk you through. I think we better start going, because it will be, the week will be over before you realize it, I think. The first chapter of the book, and indeed the first uh, one hour here, is a little bit on risk in perspective. In the book, I think it takes about 50 pages, uh, historical and all that. So we, we just want to, to stress a bit more what kind of risk management we are talking about. And so I'll talk about risk briefly, why manage risk, in this case, again, in, in the spirit of what I said before, financial risk. But this is much more general than be, beyond the financial side. And then a very important aspect is to explain to you briefly what the Q stands for, the quantitative risk management. And this is becoming increasingly important, I think, in current discussions between quantitative methods, qualitative methods. And I think that this is a quantitative course. We don't want to hide that. And we know very well there's an extremely important qualitative side. We're very well aware of that, but it's a quantitative course. So risk. <clears throat> you can look at various definitions of risk. Here we look at, this, at the Oxford uh, Dictionary. For this course, risk for us is a hazard, a chance of bad consequences, loss or exposure uh, to mischance. That's a definition. Um, in the early version of our book, we said any event or action that may adversely affect an organization's ability to achieve its objectives and execute its strategies. I don't think I want to contest that. The only thing you can say, that is a bit of a restrictive view on risk. I totally agree on that. And I'll say something later to that. Of course, and then the next line says clearly there's no single one, one line, def or no single um, one sentence definition capturing all aspects of risk. Again, for us, risk is chance of a loss. For us, is uncertainty. For us, and that's a non-trivial step, it's randomness. And of course, immediately some people among you may say, well, careful, careful, risk and uncertainty, wasn't that sort of related to Frank Knight's book in the 20s and all that? Then we know. But for us, it's a more statistical description of uncertainty based on randomness. It's an important aspect. It's by no means the only aspect. So that's why <coughs> we all owe our great thanks to uh, Kolmogorov. And I'm, I'm very glad that with Professor Ulyanov, we have a, a representative from Lomonosov University, well, close to Lomonosov University. Sorry? No, no, not, I, I know, but you, <laughs> at least from that school. And so for us, we use the language of Kolmogorov. We use the language of a sample space, although some people may call it uh, um, a realization of nature or whatever. It's for us a sample space, a little omega. We have a probability space. We have to be able to talk the probability of an event. And Kolmogorov gave us sort of a kind of garden of Eden where we can describe that mathematically. Beyond the first slide, I don't think we'll ever see again in this course this omega, but it's there. Somewhere it's on the, the, the top right corner of this, uh, of this room here. It's like the password. The omega space is there. That means it's just an anchor point for everything we write down. But of course, we go down to the level of random variables, to the level of distribution functions. But there is a strong mathematical background in whatever we do later. That's the only thing I'm saying. This is a huge uh, restriction, especially now where we have so many uh, alternative discuss discussions on how to describe risk beyond the mere mathematical quantitative probabilistic one. But that, I just want to make that short. So whenever we say a probability of an event, we know it's well-defined in some probability space if you want to have it well-defined. But it, I said, we, we won't see that again. It's there. We will mostly, uh, in this course, we will mostly uh, model situations in which an investor, and that's I give you now the actuarial or financial side, holds today an asset with an uncertain future value. Of course, we have to say, what is value? We'll do a bit of that. But it's really today's view on a future event. And as an engineer, I know there are some engineering colleagues also here, as an engineer, of course, we have a similar situation. You build a dike today, 
with safety requirements that should prevent, let's say, negative, let's say, flooding happening in, in 10, 20 years' time. It's very safe. In that case, value is uh, the, the loss coming from uh, possible inundations. So in that sense, it's all very simple. This today's view, one period ahead, we will see this morning more often. OK. So to this event, we, we model the value of an ASCII of a risky position of a risk as a random variable. You see, you, you see again this notion. But again, for us, it's just a random variable. The big X or L, if you really want to specify the loss. And several risky positions are modeled by a vector. The, and we are very precise on notation. A capital X, capital Y is typically a random variable, a single one-dimensional uh, function describing a risk. A vector is typically written boldface because risk, of course, is very often coming from co-behavior, joint behavior of various risky positions, dependence. So that's a very careful notation. Then we have the distribution function, and you see the omega has disappeared already. It's there, but it's uh, disappeared. It's... So the distribution function, or the, the joint distribution function if it's a vector, and of course these inequalities are always component-wise, x1 less than little x1, x2 and little x2, etc. We have very consistent notation here. I think one of the important aspects of the book is really to introduce consistency in notation, consistency in, in statistical thinking without overburdening it. I think it's kind of a mini-max solution. I think if you want to understand a lot of what's done in risk management on the quantitative side, I don't think you can get lower, if I may say it like that, than material we introduce in this book. You really have to be able, at, in that level, to talk about these concepts. If time matters, and of course time will matter, Time will matter immediately if we talk about time series. Time matter will immediately will, if we look, look at credit risk, then time does play a crucial role dynamically, not just today, tomorrow, as a dynamic process. Then we talk about a family of random variables, one-dimensional or d-dimensional, and that's called a stochastic process. But we'll have very specific examples there. But the first part of the course will be very much related to no dynamics, just today's view on tomorrow's value of a risk. That's already will keep us very busy, I think, for about half of the course, I think. And again, I keep on stressing this, and, and again, I stress that we're very well aware that this is a, a, a one aspect view of describing risk, is that if we will use the language of probability and statistics. That's the whole idea of this course. And of course, in, for this audience, I hope that I don't have to defend that as an important aspect of describing risk. OK. <clears throat> Financial risk, this I will do quickly. <clears throat> there are various types of risk we can discuss. Some of them we will do in detail. For instance, market risk and credit risk. We will discuss a bit more in detail. To some extent, because they're very important, I mean, especially credit risk, I think it's a very important. Think of the financial crisis, which was, you know, very, well, there are various aspects, but much related to credit risk also. So it's eminently important to perhaps to see with the modern view on credit risk, the last chapters of the book, uh, how that is. Uh, market risk will also do. Market risk is a nice example of illustrating the development of the tools we bring to you, time series, risk measures. It's nice to do it on market risk, portfolios. But again, I stress all these concepts, definitely until we reach credit, you can nearly verbatim translate into other applications. OK, but we will do it. I don't think we will discuss operational risk, but that's another risk which is very important. And the risk of losses to an institution due to uh, fraud, internal, external events, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is a very important class. Uh, we will not go into detail there. <clears throat> of course, there are many other types of risk. Just for the actuarial financial world, liquidity risk, underwriting risk, model risk. This we put in color because this course is very much also helping you to think a bit more carefully on how to describe model risk. And for instance, one chapter where I'll, we will say a bit more about that is when we do aggregation of risks. Okay, how you aggregate various 
risky views on certain positions. And then model risk becomes an issue. But model risk is very important throughout, I think. And model risk, of course, is embedded in all of the risks above. So this is a kind of a generic issue. And so the things we discuss, we will discuss with you, will very much also depend on understanding a bit bet better the, <clears throat> the risk of using a misspecified or inappropriate model for measuring risk. Of course, all models are in a way wrong. I mean, you know the, the old statement <clears throat> by George Box, uh, some of them are useful, etc. It's in a way true, but I think how, how, from that statement, how can you start to understand where this misspecification of a model can really hurt you in the end of the day? We'll have many examples of that. Do you include parameter risk in the model risk? <clears throat> For this course, that's a good question. That's, a, of course, a typical question, Frank, from, from the area of, of actuarial risk. Parameter risk is in there. I think the examples we do, I mean, parameter risk or parameter uncertainty, we will mostly look at from more of the point of parameter estimation, confidence re regions, whereas model risk, I personally will interpret more as functional model risk. For instance, you, you forget to include certain factors. You, for instance, you completely misspecify dependence by a wrong concept. So it's more the functional aspect, okay? By the way, you can ask questions. I will typically repeat the questions, I think, for the filming. That's, thank you. And please do ask questions. OK, so now, now we go to measurement and management. So risk measurement is one thing. This course is very much about measuring risk. You cannot measure, manage it if you haven't measured it. OK, so you really have to understand the concept. So, and again, you see the example here. I give you the example of a portfolio. You all know what a portfolio is. You may have one yourself, or your pension fund will typically have one, or your, your employer will have it, etc. So portfolios, we all know what that are. And for us, a portfolio of D investments, X1 to XD, I look at the one period. If time is dynamically important, there will be a little T going there. But I hold today a portfolio with position <coughs> J from 1 to D, let's say gold, one kilogram of gold, or uh, a, a share in IBM, or etc. So I have D positions. I have certain wage, which is the volume I put into that position, and I add them up. This is a linear portfolio. There will also be non-linear portfolios. We will not discuss that too much. Derivatives will play a little role at some point, but not as a key. So for us, we will typically look at random variables x, one period random variable, today, tomorrow, which is a combination of weighted, typically volume measure, weighted positions in individual risks. That's the example. And it will be typical examples later. Don't worry, we'll give concrete examples. So that's already, you can say, well, that's a rather trivial start. Just a linear function. It is indeed trivial, but you will see that there are many non-trivial questions even at that level, all right? But that's just the first one. All right, so what is now measuring the risk? And this is really a fast lane start. Of course, all the details will come later. I'm just telling you what this course may be about, but also what this course will not be about. So measuring risk is, well, easy question. Find the distribution of this random variable. Well, find the distribution giving what? I can at least know that I know how much I've got one kilogram in gold, I've got two stocks in IBM, I mean the W's I know. I may have a sort of an idea of how the, let's say, the, the price of gold from today till the end of next week is changing. I may have a model for that. So I may have a, the random variable xj, I may have a distribution function. But that's not enough. You cannot find a distribution function. You can find a mean, but not a distribution function of x if I don't know how the price of gold and the price of IBM are related. So you immediately see, I need a joint model of these. And that's, of course, a lot of this work in this course will go into understanding. Now I come to model risk. What does it mean coming up with a joint model? And then, of course, measuring risk. There's a whole industry and especially at ETH in Zurich, a whole industry of measuring risk, risk measures. We come back to that. We will introduce you to the risk measures. 
that the engineers use, return periods, that the finance, that the Basel committee uses, or the, the Swiss solvency test, they expect a shortfall of value at risk. These are risk measures, and one of them is here, but we, we come back in detail. And so I'm just giving you the colors of the picture we're going to paint for you, and then my colleagues later will paint you a very nice picture in detail. I also enter later a little bit in painting, I think. Okay, so here is, for instance, one of them is a quantile. If you have the distribution function, if you're brave enough to make strong model assumptions on the individual positions x1 to xd and joint behavior, then you may be lucky and able to find the distribution function of x, non-trivial in many cases, and you may be able to find, let's say, the inverse. This arrow, it's a bit pedantically written like this, but for the moment, just take, it's just a quantile, the inverse of the distribution function. Yeah, the alpha or one minus alpha inverse of the distribution function, okay? But we'll come back to that. But you can take any risk measure you like. You may take standard deviation if you like, if you think it's better. You may take expected shortfall if you like that. You may take any risk measure you like. But you can only start calculating if you're able, to, in this starting setup, to calculate the distribution of x. So we will explain you what all the issues are there. This will be penciled in more in detail. So I already said, and I repeat it, to this end, to this just starting, if as an engineer you want to calculate a return period where you have various aspects of, of, of a certain uh, flood, uh, at, the, at the side near the coast and you're building dikes, so you must have the co-movement of various factors influencing the flood or the sea surge. You need a joint model and how they act, or let's say, or let's call this the total size of a flood. You need a joint model of your underlying risk factors. You first have to find the risk factors. They're not just given from the sky. They just don't flutter on your desk like that. If you have a portfolio, yes, but in other examples, it's for you even to find the driving risk factors, the relevant ones. Again, Frank, model risk, all right? But then in the end, if we have good risk factors, driving risk factors or portfolio positions in this example, you see I have multiple interpretations of what we're going to talk about. Then it's a question of finding based on this joint model. And by the way, we will be very pedantic and correct in talking about joint distributions and marginal distributions. If there's one thing that caused a lot of havoc and every day all over the world is still causing a problem is by not understanding what it means having joint distribution of a risk factor and having marginal distributions. The copula later will make this story much clearer and we come to that uh, tomorrow, okay. Statistical estimates of F will be important, will be parameters or non-parametric estimation, we'll see, uh, or one of F or one of its functionals, the quantile, are obtained based on historical observation of this model. Of course, we can use Monte Carlo in some cases, we can use Bootstrap, uh, the whole of statistical tools are available if necessary. Again, still the very big picture. Risk management, yes, that's a question. That's a very good question. Is calibration, sorry, I repeat it for the, yeah. um, calibration is just a, a, a nice or, or a sort of a fancy word for parameter estimation. No, I think uh, calibration in my sense, but Alex, of course, he, he may have a very much stronger view on that, is beyond that. I mean, it's not just, I mean, for me, calibration is really how to, to get the model fitting to reality. It's not just a parameter. I think for me, calibration is more, most, uh, Perhaps we'll come back to that later. Alex, you want to? I think so. I'd, I'd say statistical estimation is a subset of calibration for me. So there may be other things you do to fix model parameters, like choosing the parameters that best match prices, for example. And Careful. It's difficult. Don't go we walk around with this thing. Yeah, I think the, the very often the standard terminology is you, if you calibrate, it's more like solving an equation. You see certain prices on the market and you 
choose model parameters so that the prices your model gives or the answers your model give coincide with what you see in the market. So in a sense, calibration is a little bit opposed to statistical estimation. If you talk about statistics, you, you look at past data and then you do estimation. And if you talk about calibration, it's typically solving equations and equating in market and model prices. Okay, for start? No, 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 of course, well, no, it's not a single, it's not a single concept, yeah. calibration. Of course, one of the, you're right, it's one of these words is used in a very broad sense. In a very specific model, if I take black soles, I calibrate the market data, I get the implied volatility aspects, of course, and we have calibration at that level. I think the problem is that for many people, calibration is using a machine and switching off your brain while you're calibrating. Well, we as mathematicians, we never switch off our brains, I think that's something, yeah. <laughs> But I, I see the point. No, no, it's not that. It's not. It's absolutely not that. And I think the example of, I often say, let's say Black Scholes. You can criticize Black, Black Scholes formula and the normality assumption and all the underlying assumptions, busy infinity. I also, I always say the fantastic thing of Black Scholes because once you start calibrating it to market data, you get implied volatility. And then implied volatility, just getting that kind of information, gives you a view on the sentiment of the market, etc. So it's way beyond, I think, just say 1.7 or something like that. Very important question, but I would expect that from you. <laughs> All right. So uh, that already we said is one of the many statements uh, cause adverse effects. The word resilience, um, I think, or fragility, if you like, uh, uh, Nassim Taleb's work on, 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 on fragility. Resilience, making system, of course, my engineering friends, like Bosa is sitting there somewhere. Bosa, where are you? Here. There. He, Bosa Stradinovich is uh, the uh, professor of uh, engineering at ETH, he's the head of the risk management of the, of the um, risk center at ETH, and he's one of the world experts on, I think it's important that you know who's here. I cannot do that with everybody, perhaps, but that you use this week also to discuss. So he's a world expert on fragility for building in earthquake environments and beyond Bosa, I'm nobody. <laughs> but you see that resilience is a big word, okay? And that's, uh, we use that also in a, in a general sense. Of course, an important bullet point here, because I, this is now a kind of a hedge. Of course, we look at the right-hand tail. Of course, we look at the losses, which for us are positive later on, as you will see in Rudiger after the break. But many of the tools of the course you can just switch science and say you can use the techniques we introduce not just for capturing risk of a position, but for capturing the upside, portfolio optimization on the risk constraints. So most of the, I would say half the material of the book, or even more, you can likewise use for managing risk on the investment side. Unfortunately, or fortunately, there's a choice we have mostly looked at translation onto the, on the defensive side, on the loss side. But many of the tools, most of them, especially at the beginning of the course, you can equally well use for in investment. Pro uh, and this is, of course, exactly, we are not just passive defensive deports risk. Of course, we will actively, willingly take risk, I hope understandably takes risk, and seek a return. Okay, but that's just to make sure that I want to make it very clear this is not just a cause on this, in our case, right-hand tail of losses. We can also use it for describing aspects of gains. But we won't do that or rather little, I think. We may in credit risk come to that. So what does now managing risk involve? Well, for instance, it can be the strength of a building. It can be the height of a dike. In our case, the example is determine the capital and I'm not very precise on the word capital. I should be much more precise, but that would be another course. But determining the capital to hold in order to absorb losses. And think of a dike height to absorb sea surges. Both for regulatory purposes, to satisfy the regulators, to, I would say to comply. It's not, we're only not there to satisfy the regulators. I think we have to comply with regulation, I think. And there are also current regulators and former regulators in the room, and I will not point fingers now. <laughs> but you can come to me and say, I want to talk to a former regulator, then I will make contact for you. Um, so this is also important, okay? 
or we can think of economic capital. There's no way in this course, but please correct me if I'm wrong, that we go into these differences. They're very important in finance. A dikeite is a dikeite. Regulatory capital, economic capital, capital itself. One should talk, start talking about shareholder equity or equity when comparing the balance sheets. No way we will discuss it. In the book it's discussed, not for this course. That goes well beyond what we want to do here. Extremely important. Okay? We all want to make sure that diversification of risk is very important. I always tell my students, as soon as somebody tells you, oh, it's diversified, then you should have a Pavlov reaction and say, well, what do you mean by that? Please tell me what you mean by diversification. we come back to that later. Or we could optimize portfolios. You say, I got a risk measure and I want to have the optimal return on my portfolio given a measure of risk. There will be some rather interesting results which go back a long time, even before the first version of the book, which I think people still are not well aware about. So we want to, we will stress that again. There will be some interesting results hidden in the course, but the moment we discuss it, we will definitely make it very explicit. Okay, so risk return consideration, that work completely started by Harry Markovitz in the 50s. You can't even, re now I'm talking finance, you can't even think what it was living in a world where optimization was just based on return. In a way, and I know there's a camera there, but in a way, at some point, we nearly were there again during the crisis. We started to optimize nearly on return because people thought there is no risk even. So, but at least Markovic knew very well what he was doing when risk return was introduced and we'll have various interesting things to say there also. So this is just to say we will go beyond at some place, places, we will really go beyond <coughs> the, the loss side. Okay, why manage financial risk? Again, the book has a lot of, quite a lot of material there. As an academic or as a, as, a, as a, well, both Belgian and Swiss citizen now, I think we have an, a societal obligation. We for us to teach you, we to learn from you, and we together to make sure that as a society we become more resilient to environmental risks, to earthquake risks, even for Switzerland, to financial risks. I often say Switzerland, and now I'm in Switzerland, a very nice part of Switzerland, although we're not in VV, according to <laughs> Francois, but it's beautiful here. It's social insurance, health, pensions, invalidity, life, and extremely important. And the tools we introduce are used, or even they were used, and we borrowed them back in our field and understand them better, I think. So we have a very important societal responsibility you as actuaries, you as engineers, you as economists, traders, whatever, whatever all the professions are, and regulators. Um, this is related to systemic importance. A lot of the tools we introduce have been used, are used, very often hidden, to try to understand systemic risk. The risk of the domino effect in the system. Okay, how can a lot, and now you see interdependence becomes important. When everything is independent, all risks, without even being mathematical about it, hitting one is not really affecting hitting the other. As soon as we have dependence, as we, as we understand their joint behavior, then of course it becomes important. Okay? Things like too big to fail, by the way, too big to save, I think is more important even, I think, for a country like ours and many countries like yours, because I know there's a, we haven't counted the number of uh, countries here, but I think you can compare it with your own country. Moral hazard should be avoided. It's in the background, not, will not be discussed. Um, better risk management can reduce the risk of company failure and protect customers and policyholders. Very important, insurance risk, and now my friends, they can make themselves known if necessary, <laughs> the former regulators or regulators. Solvency too, Swiss solvency test, so, I mean, capital requirements for insurance companies is very much about policyholder protection. The banking world on Basel II was very much about saving individual banks. What Basel II 
did wrong early on, and we really wrote about it in 2001, very officially to the Basel Committee, is they neglected endogeneity of risks and spillover of risk, systemic risk. Okay, but all these aspects are, on a societal point of view, extremely eminent. We will not teach you that. We will teach you the tools, statistical tools, to be engaged in this particular kind of discussions. Okay? So I already mentioned the endogeneity. Endogeneity means risk from within. Exogenous means a shock from outside, setting up uh, problems in a system, in a, in a financial system. Let's say an earthquake is an exogenous shock. Endogeneity is, let's say, for some reason, you're all the traders, high frequency traders, and something triggers that you all start doing similar things. Running for the exit. That's an endogenous shock, a shock from within the system. And, and again, what we will not treat, but it's definitely in the background where you can use some of these tools, is what the current developments, let's say, in the world of fin, uh, fintechnic, financial, or the world of blockchain, uh, smart contracts. The world is going to change. Well, the world is always going to change, of course, but I think there's a massive change around the corner. Again, we not discuss it, but the tools we discuss with you enter the language of this discussion. Okay. Paul, well, when I read this, regulation should be designed with care. It should not promote herding. Uh, I mean, what we're observing right now, aren't we just observing just the opposite? Okay, so Frank is saying that isn't uh, the, the, the current regulation indeed um, uh, promoting herding in a sense? Well, this is exactly what we wrote about in 2001. In 2001, although we may have not used the word, I'm sure the word herding is there, by, by forcing participants or companies that exist into a financial system to use the same tool, the standard model, and I know, you, you, I know this is behind in your mind, but the same standard model, the same risk measure, the same ABC, by definition, there's a herding consequence there. It is, and I think we should be careful about that. I know, Frank, it's, it's, uh, this is already in our 2001 uh, report. It's still on my website, uh, 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 an academic response to Basel II. It is, it is. Uh, I, I would really hope that, that some of you, in the breaks, that knock on Frank uh, Kerper's shoulder, say, well, what do you mean by that, and discuss with, with you, Rene, because <laughs> I know you know much more about that. Rene Dams, <laughs> the pink uh, guy there. <laughs> I think it's important that you, because there's much more, and that's why the breaks are longer also, I think. Okay? It's there. Well, <clears throat> the queue. So this is now, the first part was a very, very brief summary of about 50 pages in the book. Just read them. If you can't sleep at night, just read the first 50 pages. I think it's, it's a good summary of <coughs> various aspects that we have uh, discussed. But it's only text. The second part here is now, the, now I come to the core. Why did we write that book? And now I go back to my beginning co-authors, uh, Rudiger and Alex. Why did we come up with the quantitative risk management? I think we came close to coining the, the phrase, the, 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 the term. Of course, I'm, I'm, we're definitely not the first, but we were very close. I think we're getting close in establishing a field. But now we have to say, what is the field? What's so special about the Q in quantitative risk management? Well, we treat QRM as a quantitative science. With all the provisos I already mentioned, I know there's a qualitative human aspect in the background that enter into some of the modeling. We're not doing that. There's no behavioral finance in this book, but we are very well aware of it. And probability and statistics is our toolkit, given. Mathematics and statistics will provide us with a suitable language and with appropriate concepts for describing financial risk. Appropriate up to a certain level. Again, if I talk about behavioral, which is now quite different from the engineering world, I think if you build a dike buzzer, I don't think behavioral aspects enter. Uh, perhaps for the political side in deciding what's a safety measure, but once you start building and measuring, I think it's, it's really hard engineering. 
course, here we know there's another aspect. We don't do that, okay? We, very important, and I think I really, that the things you learn this week will really make, sh you will make sure that you exactly know what assumptions and limitations are. If, for instance, to, to, to mention a very famous example, you want to use joint risk in a credit portfolio using a Gaussian copula, fine with me. But you should really know what the conditions are and make yourself, con convince yourself yes or no, they're satisfied. That's just one example. Not just randomly chosen, but there are many more. So assumptions and limitations, that's something you all have to walk away with. And of course, my colleagues also in Lausanne here in the actuarial group, of course, that's, I think, our way of teaching things. One aspect, I mean, like Hans-Jürg Halbrecher, one of the professors here in, in insurance mathematics, I think you will really understand that. And now we're already quite a way up to model risks understanding. So the Q in our QRM is an essential part of the risk management process. We believe it remains, if applied correctly and honestly, a part of the solution to managing risk, not the problem. Of course, the, the statement here is because after the crisis, we may come back to that later when we talk about copulas, or perhaps not, or you can ask me various stories when we go on the excursion. Of course, mathematics was trashed as at some point even the culprit of the financial crisis. And the famous article uh, on, on Wired magazine how a mathematical formula destroyed Wall Street. Of course, totally ridiculous. I always said, if it's a mathematical formula that destroyed Wall Street, I can quickly correct it. And you know, there's no way we can correct Wall Street for the moment, I think. There's still a lot of issues there. Wall Street is really the general world of finance, okay? So <clears throat> this statement by Steve Shreve, a famous mathematical, sci uh, mathematical finance professor, uh, in, in Carnegie Mellon, I think Carnegie Mellon, yeah. Uh, don't blame the quants, the quantitative people, us, the four of us, don't blame us. Well, we take a bit of blame, at least those of us who are involved in discussing around that period. But hire good ones, i.e., I hope that they hire you, and I know of many of you that have already been hired, and instead listen to them. And again, I could, I could tell you many stories, but unfortunately, we should once give a summer school on just stories on, in QRM, but this is, <laughs> this is not going to happen, okay? So I will have not, in just this introduction, I can tell you very few things, but, but that's an important statement. I mean, you should be proud of the Q of quantitative in QRM, and don't let yourself be bullied by people say, well, well, all this quantitative stuff, see where it brought us. Always think of this statement which is very, very true. And I have many, many examples in my personal life how important that is. And that they should have listened. Not always, we can also get it wrong, of course. But we also do get it wrong. The nature of the challenge, it has two main strands. We could current practice in, onto a firm mathematical background. That's good, that's important. We look what is currently done in the world of risk measurement, in risk management, Risk, constructing of risk measures, portfolio optimization, aggregation. Well, let's at least write it down mathematically what it exactly means. And then we can measure the distance to real practical use. We put together techniques and tools which go beyond current practice, so you learn things in this course that are new, that may not have been fully used yet. It was definitely true when we wrote the book in 2005. It was definitely true when we introduced, reintroduced the notion of copulas in risk management. And you'll get the full story there, I think. So that was an example where I know it, and you know it, Alex, 15 years ago, if I would have asked who has heard about the notion of copula, nobody would lift a hand. Now if I ask, it's a rhetorical question, you all lift your hand, because you've all heard about it. That's an example of new tools. So this, what are the particular challenges? And this is now basically like the chapters. Extremes matter. Well, how do you describe extremes? We'll have that on Wednesday morning, I think. Sorry? Tomorrow, tomorrow morning. morning. Tomorrow morning. All right, we have it tomorrow morning. I should know because I, I teach it, so. <laughs> <laughs> so no, no sleeping tonight. <laughs> Interdependent and concentration of risk. How do you describe that mathematically? 
with an eye for practice, clear eye for practice. The problem was scale. Scale can be, in many ways, scale can be high dimensionality. And I think with, with Marius and Alex, we have uh, one of the, two of the, uh, the world experts on very high dimensional models. And very high is not three or four. I mean, very high is, is hundreds or thousands of components. All right, that's a very, that's, that's scale. Interdisciplinarity, clearly. We will not teach interdisciplinary, but believe me, all of us, all four of us, have experience in interdisciplinary discussions at all levels. I a bit more because I'm a bit older, but we have done it at all levels of, of, of risk management all over the world. So this is important, you're aware of that. Communication education. I hope by the end of the week, well, education is there, that you've learned something, then we're fine on that, and that somehow you said, well, what these four guys have been doing, well, somehow the communication was not that bad. We try to do our best, that's why also we have so much work we've done especially my colleagues on preparing the material. I mean, communication is, if there's one statement that is always made about students in mathematics going into industry, can they communicate? Also similarly, can we communicate what we want to communicate? There we are, so that's the first part now. I still have five, six minutes, so I'll go into the, the next part and Rudiger after the break will take over. So again, the first part, I'll just give you an overview of the first chapter of the book, highlighting where this course will be going. Now we start on the technicalities, but not very technical. We make it specific, and you can say, well, that's very, very special. Okay, it's special, but there is a reason for that. A first important, important word is mapping. It's perhaps the most important aspect which is very often neglected. I said before, when you describe a risk, whether it's an earthquake risk, whether it's a financial risk, whether it's a, a risk, a medical risk, environmental risk, what are the key underlying driving factors? And if you don't have the relevant factors in your model, surely you will not be able to describe your risk model well. You don't need all of them. So Alex will do definitely a part on factor models in the financial context, but that's called a mapping. You map your key risk onto a class of risk factors. In the financial world, I'm talking about thousands of factors. Again, scale. I'm not talking about models with two or three factors. No, thousands of factors. That's how a bank balance sheet or a liability and insurance side, it may depend on so many factors out there. So that's called a mapping. You should try to make that explicit as possible, okay? So again, we have a portfolio of assets. And then we talk the value of the portfolio at time t. I will not go much beyond that, I think. That's another matter. Because now you can say, well, what do you mean by value? Is it mark to market? If you want the value of a position, one ounce in gold, I can just open the newspaper, or you can open your little machine, click on an app or whatever, and you can read of the, the momentary, momentary value of gold. If, however, you ask that the value of my life insurance contract, well, you don't know because you don't know my health. I think I still feel good now, but you see, that's a kind of factors you don't know about, and yet it plays a role in insurance. Or you have a model, gold is traded all over the world every millisecond, but you might have a private equity position where there's only very few traded, or somebody comes up with a catastrophe bond. Recently, we've been doing some work on catastrophe bonds in China, where we have very restricted information. Then the value might be value to model, with some data in the background. So there are various aspects of value. So it's easy to say it's a value. Well, we now say it, VT is the value. All the rest would not almost be an, an extra course, but we discuss it in the book today. Important, it's today's, so our point of view in the beginning is we have a position, a risk, I call it. I look at it today, and I want to know the value in the future. There must be a model. So that's exactly this VT. We're given a fixed time horizon delta T, one week, two weeks, one year. This often very much depends on the application. In high frequency trading, it may be one millisecond. In standard trading, it may be one day, 10 days, two weeks, trading weeks. In credit, 
it may be 10 days. Uh, sorry, it may be one year. In life insurance, it may be 20, 30 years. So there is very often an inherent, inherent uh, time frame there. And we assume that there are no intermediate payments in between. These are just, of course you say, there's always something in between. I agree. But let's just start to walk, and then we can run last, later. This is OK for small times. If I want to predict, let's say, short time ahead, it will be much more difficult a longer time period for delta large. The next thing is that we will introduce is the change of value. This is just a statistical thing. Why? Because most of the models in finance are typically written as changes in value. Why? The returns. If you think, well, I don't know exactly what the value of that stock is, but I know the return is roughly 1% uh, on whatever basis. The returns, they stick in our mind much more naturally than the exact values. That's also why we typically look at the, the differences. The value in the future minus value today. I should have written that, and I've said, we should have written the V as little v, because it's known today. But I think it's just a, a mild, it's not an error, it's just a mild. Uh, and of course, this minus sign is just saying we go from the left tail, the losses are in, not in the left, they're in the right tail. This is our prerogative. When we talk, and this is also in finance. If you talk in, in banking lingo, you say uh, a value at risk of 20 million, you talk about a loss. You mention it positively. So the minus sign is just convenience, and we don't have to keep on changing from left to right. The distribution of this change minus the change in value over one period of time, this can be any, any period of time, is called the loss distribution. In practice, people talk about p &L, but we drop the, the profit. We just keep the L in the language, but that's just okay. It's the profit and loss distribution, okay? And again, the minus, uh, and this is the thing we're after, okay? And we will, the market risk will do exactly how to calculate these things with the techniques we develop. Of course, if we go over longer time horizons, we should discount. Now, it's nice, perhaps, that Mathematicians, I'll stop on this slide. Mathematicians, of course, often make the uh, assumption in the whole of math finance, let's assume the interest rate is zero. Now, of course, we live in a time where this is somehow a very, a very correct assumption. So you can assume R to be zero. Well, R is negative in Switzerland. Yeah. <laughs> it's even negative. So, but you will not see discounting. Of course, if you go for long-time liabilities, you should discount and all that. That plays a role. But for the moment, we're on the safe ground by assuming it's zero. I stop there. We have half an hour coffee break outside downstairs.